Um, first of all, uh, welcome to everybody. We are so happy you're here to this gathering that is sponsored by the Mesothelioma Applied Research Foundation and our very special MISO community champion, Senator Patty Murray. Um, we're pleased to have Sean Bills, who's a legislative assistant in the office of Senator Murray's office, to greet us here today. Before we begin, I would like to make a very quick introduction. We have a very special guest here today, Sue Vento, who is, went where? Oh, Sue Vento's in the back of the room. Sue Vento is the wife of um, Bruce Vento, who was a representative from Minnesota and who died of mesothelioma. How many years ago now, Sue? 11 years ago. And Sue is a real champion of the cause, and we're so grateful she's here. Thank you. Thank you, Sue, for coming. And um, let me turn this over to Sean Bills. So just really quickly, um, Senator Murray apologizes she couldn't be here in person. They're, um, they're voting on some amendments on the floor right now. But uh, she wanted me to come here to, to talk to you a little bit about her work on uh, mesothelioma awareness and, uh, and banning asbestos. Um, obviously, many of you know that she uh, sponsored the resolution last Congress to, to create uh, National Mesothelioma Awareness Day, uh, which is uh, a, a, a great thing to have, to have done, obviously. Um, and she's worked for many, many years now, too many, unfortunately, to ban the use of asbestos in the United States, which she thinks is just a tragedy that we're still using this product that is known to cause such a uh, uh, a horrible disease. Um, but she wanted me to deliver a slightly different message. Um, many of you may not know her uh, personally. She's from Washington State. And she got into politics because a Washington State program was being cut that her children used for childcare, a preschool program. And so she wrote her state senator and basically got the brush off. And she decided to create a phone tree and contact all of her friends and start doing personal advocacy on the program and through that, save that program. And I think the message she wants to deliver to you here today is that what you're doing is absolutely critical. Going out and reaching out to all of the offices that you're going to today to spread the word that this, that this work needs to continue to happen, that we need to spread awareness so that you can continue to fight and find a cure for this problem is absolutely critical. So she thanks you for what you're doing. We're looking forward in our office to meeting some constituents from Washington State today and applaud what you're doing. Happy to sponsor uh, this event and, and in this beautiful room with this great view of the Capitol. So look forward to the conversation today and continuing to work on this issue, these issues with you. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Um, Senator Ma uh, Murray has always been a champion uh, to our community, and we're really grateful. Next, we're going to hear from our own Mary Hessdorfer. Mary, for those of you who don't know, Mary is a nurse practitioner with over a decade's experience working with mesothelioma patients. She currently serves as the medical liaison of the Mesothelioma Applied Research Foundation, where she directs patient education and support efforts. And I would say there isn't anyone here who hasn't been touched by Mary's kind and gentle hand. And those of you who haven't met Mary, those of you who are staffers, please come and say hello to Mary. Mary, please. Thank you. I'd like to echo Hannah's words and thank you for coming and uh, hearing us out. Uh, there are so many times that there are so many foundations that I know knock on your doors and you know, everyone is pleading for something, but this really, this is a cause that we really want you to, to really get involved with us. We really need your help. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the disease because I know so many of you are not really familiar with it. Um, you hear the name on commercials, but I'm sure that there are many people here who've never even met a mesothelioma patient. Um, mesothelioma is a form of cancer, and it's uh, directly related to exposure to asbestos. Um, patients are exposed to asbestos anywhere from 10 to 40 years, and the disease will then develop. So I have patients in their 80s who may have done construction work when they were in their 20s who are now just developing the disease. 
Uh, it's a disease that will be with us even when asbestos is banned. So it is a disease that we really need to work on and we need to find more effective treatments. Uh, mesothelioma affects uh, about 3,500 uh, people a year. And uh, we have three, thir I'm sorry, 3,500 a year are diagnosed and we lose 3,000 a year to the disease. Uh, Navy vets account for about one third of all those patients diagnosed. So if we just look at those numbers and we say one third, so one third of 3,500 is about what, 3,000? I mean about 300. So we look at those numbers and we say that's the amount of people that we're losing from the Navy to this disease year after year. Uh, people in the armed forces were also exposed to asbestos uh, as uh, in, in, uh, military responders for first alerts, firemen, policemen, and then everyday people as they're doing home renovations. So every, it's everyone's problem and everyone is at risk for developing the disease. Uh, where is the disease? The disease can uh, take place in the lung, and that's referred to as pleural mesothelioma. Uh, the majority of cases are plural. Uh, it affects the lining of the lung. So what happens is your entire lung gets encased with the disease, and patients can no longer breathe effectively, and eventually it, uh, it results in, uh, in an early demise. Uh, peritoneal mesothelioma is found in the abdomen, and there's about 250 cases a year diagnosed with peritoneal mesothelioma. And then we have rare cases of uh, pericardial mesothelioma, which directly affects the lining of the uh, heart muscle, so the heart no longer can effectively pump. Uh, and then we also have cases of uh, testicular and scrotal mesothelioma. Uh, in terms of treatment, um, the FDA approved uh, Olympta in 2004, and that's the only approved drug for mesothelioma. Unlike breast cancer, which has about 10 or 11 drugs approved, colon cancer, which has many different regimens. Mesothelioma has one. So patients have one shot at one drug to get a response. Uh, and it's not really a great response. Uh, we had a, a nationwide trial, uh, and we looked at Olympta and cisplatinum, which is our combination, versus cisplatinum alone. The response plate rate for cisplatinum alone was 9.3 months. And with the addition of uh, Olympta to the cisplatinum regimen, the average survival is 12.2 months. So as you can see, we really have great strides that we have to make. Um, in terms of surgery, when we look at the numbers, we talk about 3,500 patients are diagnosed with the disease. Less than 15% of those patients are diagnosed at an early enough stage to have surgery. So it's very few people are able to have the surgery. And the surgical options, uh, though available, are, are certainly something that is very difficult to get a patient through. Uh, one surgery is called an extrapleural pneumonectomy. And in that surgery, we remove the lung, the lining of the lung, the lining of the mediastinum, which is in the center of the chest, the lining of the heart, parts of the diaphragm, and we usually have to remove a few of the ribs as well. Following that surgery, patients are given chemotherapy and radiation therapy. And in the best case series, the average survival following that grueling surgery is only about 26 months. Um, we have a lesser surgery, and you know, we describe it as a lesser surgery because in comparison, you know, it, it seems less, but it's called a pleurectomy, and that's a surgery that probably takes about seven or eight hours, and that's where they painstakingly peel the lining off the entire lung. Uh, picture an apple and trying just to get that lining off they inflate and deflate that lung as they're trying to get into the crevices. And the goal of that surgery is try to eradicate as much disease as possible. And that, again, is followed by chemotherapy. And we have a number of protocols that we're looking at to see if we can effectively deliver radiation therapy following that. In terms of relapse, the relapses can be anywhere. Um, patients who can have uh, pleural mesothelioma, when they relapse, about 25% of those cases will relapse into the abdomen. Uh, they can relapse into the chest wall and into the contralateral lung. So once they've already sacrificed one lung and the disease comes back in the, uh, in the opposite lung, patients really have a very difficult time getting through treatment uh, and you know, trying just to get some effective, uh, effective treatment and to buy some quality time. Um, peritoneal mesothelioma is, uh, is handled similar to an extrapleural pneumonectomy. Um, we open up the entire abdomen, we remove all visible evidence of disease, and we take out what's called the omentum, uh, which is the fatty apron that lines the, uh, the abdominal cavity. Uh, the disease likes to really embed into the, uh, into the omentum. 
Uh, the spleen is usually taken out because in embryonic origin, the peritoneum actually grows out of the spleen. Uh, then patients are given a heated perfusion of chemotherapy direct, uh, directly into the abdomen uh, to, you know, to try to clean up any, uh, any microscopic cells that may be left behind. Uh, and these are our treatments. Those are the only th uh, three treatments that are available for patients with mesothelioma that have been FDA approved. So what do we do with patients who are relapsed? We don't have any good data because we have so few patients that we don't have large trials looking at second-line therapy or alternative therapies. So we have a number of drugs that we've looked at in small trials, and many of those trials may only be about 25 patients. Um, because of the numbers. Uh, when we look at lung cancer, it's not unusual to run a lung cancer trial and to have 2,000 or 3,000 patients participating in that trial. But a mesothelioma trial can only be 25, 30 patients. Uh, and at best, if we mount a multi-nation uh, trial, which one we have currently uh, ongoing, took five and a half years to get the necessary amount of patients to have a meaningful answer to our question, do we have a second-line therapy? And that's, uh, that's something we're waiting to hear about now. Um, what we really need, we need money and we need funding for research. This is a disease because it is called an orphan disease that there is little interest in pharmaceutical companies to pursue us. Um, there's little interest among, um, uh, among philanthropists because so few people are diagnosed with the disease that they don't, they don't develop a personal affinity to the disease. But if you look around this room, I want you to realize that everyone in this room has been affected by this disease. I have children here who've lost their mother. I've had children who've lost their father. I have children here whose mothers are, are currently un undergoing treatment. I have elder gentlemen. I have people who've served in the armed forces. Uh, I have a patient here from the Netherlands. I have another patient here from Jamaica. It's a global problem, and with immigration and with uh, uh, with armed forces fighting in some of the third world countries, we have our vets exposed daily to, to asbestos. So it's a problem that won't go away. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to ask you to direct uh, mesothelioma as a, as a, as a, for a peer-reviewed medical research program to have a direct line for mesothelioma. And we're asking to have uh, Congress appropriate $5 million to help us make some headway into this disease because losing, losing the number of patients that we lose every year is so hurtful, and we really need to make a change, and we really need to give people their lives back. Thank you. You heard it, $5 million. That's a pretty paltry sum, isn't it, when you think about what a professional athlete is paid? For example, a fraction of what a professional athlete is paid in a year would make headway into finding effective treatment for mesothelioma. I mean, you can put it into perspective into your own lives as well. What does a house cost these days? What does a house cost in California in these days, where I'm from? It doesn't take much to realize that it's a very small amount of money that we're asking for. And it's almost embarrassing to be asking for such a small amount twice that much would be very nice. Thank you, Mary, thank you very much. We're now going to be hearing from Mike Clements. Mike was diagnosed with pleural mesothelioma in 2005 at the age of 59. Mike is a Navy veteran who, was, who, actively, participate, who actively participates in the mesothelioma community. And he generously shares his experience and the lessons he has learned. Mike? Thank you. Um, just to give you a little bit of background about myself, I'm a native San Diegan. It's a rare breed, there's not many of us. Most of them are imports. Um, when I grew up, San Diego was a Navy town. We've gotten bigger than that now. We still have a huge military presence, but we no longer think of ourselves as a Navy town. But in fact, I was a first generation Navy brat. My dad was career Navy. Um, did the typical thing after, after high school, I went on to college. 
This is 1966. Didn't really know what I was going to do. It was Vietnam. My game plan was probably get drafted and go over and get myself killed. And then I thought, wait a minute, I'm a Navy brat. Why would I want to do that? So I volunteered and joined the Navy. Um, in boot camp, they mentioned submarine physical, and I always liked the silent service where the submarine did the emergency surface. And I volunteered. The part I forgot was there's no windows. So, but, uh, anyway, that's a, that was a six-year commitment to go into nuclear power. So what I want to talk about as far as my Navy experience, while not everybody's in the Navy, there's a lot of similarities that we all have. Boot camp, training, schools, and then generally on to the fleet. Um, for instance, boot camp, the buildings were old. Steam heat, asbestos piping, the lagging on. Same thing with the, the classrooms, they were all old. Asbestos was everywhere. So you, have, you had daily exposure, okay? Then you move on to the fleet, and you, if you're on a ship, once again, most of the ships are steam powered, and again, there's the asbestos out there. But it, it's in places you don't even think about. For instance, I was on a submarine tender for nine months. We went up to Mare Island Naval Shipyard, and as a cost cutting measure, they used the mess crew. At the time, that was what I was assigned to. They used the mess crew to strip the mess decks to get ready for the overhaul people to do the final finished work. So myself and a crew of eight other people, we were out there after our normal 12-hour work day as mess cooks. We were putting in an extra four hours a day, chipping paint off the bulkheads and the floors, and, or maybe I should say ceilings and, and walls. Well, one of the things that was there that I remember very clearly, and, and this mess deck was huge. It was probably four times the size of this room. It's a big ship. Linoleum floors. We were out there and we chiseled off that linoleum floor and it was over a steel deck and it wasn't level. So we were out there with grinding wheels grinding that down. The only thing I remember using was the dust mast. At the end of the day, our dungarees, we were just covered and we were white from head to foot. We laughed about it. We had no idea that that was asbestos in that cement. So there's just one example of the kind of exposures you could get, and nobody knew what was going on. Nobody, nobody tried to harm us. It wasn't int intentional, but nonetheless, the exposure's there. Okay, now you're in the overhaul, and things are going around your ship. You're passing through the room where somebody else is working on it. Once again, you're exposed. As you're walking out to your car, the dry dock next to you, somebody's out there with an, an air hose blasting away the dust. You don't know what's in there. So shipyards are a terrible source of the exposure for people. But again, the day-to-day -day stuff, many of, the, many of the trades, electricians, they're exposed to it in the wiring, arc chutes, circuit breakers. It, 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 basically, it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. Um, unfortunately, I had three shipyard experiences. I, my submarine tender was at Mare Island. When I finished my training, and, and, and the reason you're in for six years, by the way, is uh, if you go into nuclear power, you spend an extra full year in school besides your, your rating training. So that's why they, they obligate you for six years. So I reported on board my submarine at Portsmouth Naval Shipyard in Kittery, Maine. It was in for repairs. So that was my second shipyard experience. I rode the boat for three years, and before we, before I left the Navy, it went back into the, the shipyard for overhaul. So I've been in three different shipyards, and on that last time, um, one of the things we did is we changed out the neutron detectors on the core, which means on the reactor they totally remove all the insulation, all the shielding, to go in and change out the neutron detectors. So once again, there's an opportunity. So basically, throughout my six years in the Navy, I had exposure, and I would say that that's not untypical of any sailor. And it's, some of the other military services have similar experiences, depending on the crafts they ran. So the, the message about the, the Navy is it doesn't surprise me when they quote a figure of a third of us are military experience, because it's just everywhere. Okay, that, 
that kind of gives you the sense of where I was military-wise. So now I'm going to try to fast forward through the next 33 years because I, I don't want to I don't want to bore you guys to death. Um, got out of the Navy, returned to San Diego, went to school on a VA again, met my wife, and said the 37 years, by the way, and uh, we. <laughs> So we, we got married and we started doing our best to live the American dream. You know, we got out of school, got jobs, worked hard, started budgeting money, bought a house, you know, saved for the future, did all the things that, that you want to do and you try to do, and thought we were really pretty successful at it. Um, I was able to retire, retire at the very end of 2003. I was a month short of being 58 years old, so to retire at 57, I thought, we've done a good job. We've come a long ways. She couldn't afford to retire, but I could. Um, so any, anyway, as, as a compromise, I agreed to become a house husband. And so I would do things like grocery shopping, and vacuuming and dusting. But because my cooking skills were limited to the barbecue, she still had to come home and cook dinner for me. But uh, I had a really good year. I really enjoyed that year of retirement. It was wonderful. And in hindsight, I can't tell you how important that was to me. One of the things that I did during that year is I made a commitment to myself. I said, I'm going to get healthier. And so I started working out of the gym three days a week. And at the time, it was just a goal to be healthy. I had no idea other than that. That was why I was doing it. Well, just be about a year after, our uh, pursuit of the American dream came, became a nightmare because I went to the doctor and said, you know, I've been coughing for three months and we've talked about it, but it's still not going away. And I personally thought it was my blood pressure medication. They said, no, no, the dosage is much too low. We need to look around. So they said, well, maybe you've got pneumonia. They did an x-ray. Doctor said, you're fine, but a really sharp radiologist that reviewed the x-ray found a little spot. And he pulled out an x-ray from a year before, and there was no little spot. So that started the, the really digging. And so then over the course of the next couple of months, we did CT scans and PET scans. And by February, they said, yeah, you've got some kind of cancer, but we're not really sure what it is. I had had melanoma many years before, and they said, maybe the melanoma's back. And it's on the inside. And I thought, well, that's really bad news. How naive I was at the time. Um, it took another two months, but ultimately they said, no, it's not melanoma, it's mesothelioma. Well, that's when I got really scared because my dad died of mesothelioma in 1991. And he was in Florida, but we flew back three times to see him during that last year. And, and I've got to be honest with you, watching what happened to my dad watching the way he basically disintegrated from a, a strong, healthy man that could go out on the end of a shovel and work me until I would beg for mercy to the point where he was just a shell of his previous self. And my dad, he's, he's one of the most pain-resistant people I've ever seen in my life. He just wouldn't even talk about it. I remember when he broke his finger and he looked at it and said, yep, my finger's broken. It was sitting there with a zigzag. I remember asking him and I said, Dad, what, what's it like? And he just looked at me and he said, son, it's really bad. Well, when he said that, that told me if it was my turn, I'd be screaming. So when they said mesothelioma, I'm immediately flashing back to that and saying, I don't know if I can face that. So I desperately wanted some answers. Well, initially with the plural, they said the EPP is your best chance, but you know, you're not healthy enough and you're not in good enough shape and that's probably not gonna work for you. And I said, no, I'm not, I'm not gonna accept that as an answer. Test me. Well, that working out of the gym really paid off because when they put me through the stress test, all of a sudden everything changed and all of a sudden I'm a good candidate for surgery, okay? And I'm gonna have surgery, great, except that now the surgery scares the hell out of you, okay? So back up and say, can I have a second opinion? 
So we did that. Second opinion says your EPP is your best chance for survival. So that's what we did. Well, that takes some time. So I had my surgery on August 1st, 2005. If you do the math, I'm about, f and I like to count for my surgery date. I figure that's what saved my life. So I'm about five weeks short of being a six-year survivor by my count. I'm, I'm So basically what I want to do is I want to tell you a little bit about my experience and everybody's is different, okay? And, and I want to do kind of a disclaimer, much like Mary did. I am not saying this, I'm, I'm not looking for your sympathy, I'm not looking for your admiration. I just want you to know what people with this disease have to go through to survive, okay? And it's not easy. And no, nobody, nobody wanted it, it just happens to us, okay? I, I did the EPP surgery. I was lucky. I had a great surgeon. He did a good job. About seven hours in surgery, 10 days hospitalization. You go through all that. Um, and then I had a recovery period to, to, get, to recover from the surgery and finally we decided that, okay, it's, it's time for radiation. Radiation started out fine. Um, I met a lot of friends. I had a bunch of fellows in there. Most of them were in there for prostate cancer. But we were in there five days a week, chatting and all that. And uh, we all went to about the same period of time. Only the thing that I noticed is after several weeks, they were still feeling pretty good. I wasn't feeling so good. And it just continued to get worse. I didn't know how bad it was. Um, my wife took a photograph of my back. I asked her, I asked her, I said, take a picture. She took the picture, but she wouldn't let me see it for months and months and months. Um, when she finally let me see the picture, I had a spot on my back about that big that was just blistered and burned black. It looked, it just looked like I had been in a fire. Okay, that's how, how, how bad it was. When I talked to the radiologist at the end, they gave me this very nice certificate and the whole staff came out and applauded me. And I said, why, why are we doing this? And they said, you completed the treatment. And I said, well, yeah. And they said, we thought you were gonna quit. And I said, I don't recall anybody telling me I had the option to quit. <laughs> I probably would have considered it. It was pretty bad there at the end. Um, but he, I, I said, exactly how much radiation did you give me? And he said, well, you think about those prostate guys. And he said, we're zapping area that big on them. He said, we're zapping area this big on you. He said, I gave you as much radiation as I could without killing you. That was his goal. So it took pain to a whole new level. Um, I learned a great deal about drugs. I have been through morphine and methadone and just about every drug that you can imagine in various combinations. Um, and in fact, that was one of the problems. One of the things that, that I talked about my doctor, and in hindsight, I probably shouldn't have, I told him, I said, you know, it takes me like three hours to get moving in the morning to get out of bed. For some reason, I just can't get myself functioning. But then once I'm up and I'm dressed and everything, then I can get through my day okay. And the answer was, well, you're obviously depressed. You've got mesothelioma. It's basically, you know, it's a death sentence, so you, you must be depressed. So I let him give me So the lights went out for two years. Okay, for two years, she was all alone taking care of me. I wasn't home. You know, my whole life, all my training was about fixing things and problem solving. It was so bad that a simple little thing like a game that it was time to change the batteries out, there's four screws, it would take me three days to get up the courage to remove those four screws to change out the batteries because I was afraid I was going to mess it up somehow. And it took me a long time to realize just how bad off I was mentally. And finally, I just I told my doctors, I said, I, I can't go on this way. I want my mind back. So we started experimenting, and I went through withdrawal on all kinds of drugs. Not fun. You know, I, people talk about getting high on drugs. I've done every drug in the world. I never got high on anything, but I can tell you the withdrawal is god-awful. I've got a lot of experience in withdrawal. 
So um, eventually got off the Prozac, got my mind back, and it was nice to come back and have a life with her again, and I'm sure she was grateful for the company. Um, so since then, things are better. I've learned to live with pain. I, right now I just wear patches on my back. It's, it's a lidoderm. It's twice the strength of the spray that you can get for sunburn, but it helps a little bit. Um, and you just learn to deal with it. Okay. That pretty much brings us to the present. That's the way life is now. Am I the person that I was before the surgery? No, and I never will be. I still probably, if I had to guess, I have somewhere maybe 40 to 50% of my strength still. I can pick up 50 pounds and carry it over to the far end of the room, and I'm pretty much exhausted at that point. So, you know, it's, it's not, I'm not, I'm not who I was, and I never will be, but I'm very grateful to be who I am. Okay, to finish this thing up, and this will be the hard part. I'm a six-year survivor. The question is, that keeps popping up in my mind and has been there for years, why? Why me? Why have I made it six years? So many people don't. And I struggled with that thing for a long time, and I finally decided there must be a reason I had to do something to help somebody else. Okay? Didn't know how until I found Marf by accident. And I started lurking around the website, wasn't really sure what was going on. I didn't know if I wanted to join. After a while, I contacted Marf and got involved. I was encouraged to write my survivor story, and that kind of eased me into it. Then Mary asked me if I would be willing to talk to other survivors who were newer in the process and were facing what I was facing, and I thought, it's the least I could do. Because one of the first things that they did for me is they put me in touch with a survivor, Klaus. I don't know, most of, the, most of you recognize the name. I had no idea who he was at the time. He was just a nice guy that started telling me about what I was gonna be facing as an EPP patient. So, Again, Marf, Marf provided me the opportunity to help. Last year, I participated in the doctor-patient panel, and again, I felt like I was doing something. It's not easy standing up here talking like this. But again, if I can do something to help somebody else, that's what I want to do. And frankly, for those of you who are here representing Congress and the senators and you need to understand that there's people that aren't in this room. They didn't make it. I'd like to believe I'm speaking for them. And we need your help. So it's greatly appreciated. Thank you. Great husband. <laughs> okay, Mike, you spoke for everyone. Thank you, including my son Adam. Thank you. Um, this was a very important event, and those of you who are new to the disease um, maybe have a small understanding now of how it affects its victims. Banning asbestos is essential, but treating effectively and finding a cure for mesothelioma is vital. Our lives depend on it. Asbestos is going to be around for a very long time. The disease is going to be around even longer, given the latency period. Um, I know many of you have probably been formulating questions in your mind to ask our panelists today. So please raise your hand if you have a question and, um, and, and don't be shy. Is there anyone out there? What a quiet group. This is most unusual. Yes, please. Uh, 
What is the current state of the law on banning asbestos? What is the, maybe, maybe our uh, Senator Murray's office right. will have something to say about that. Yeah, and I didn't plan on being on the panel, just doing the introduction, but happy to answer that question. Um, Senator Murray has been working for a long time to, to pass legislation um, in the 110th Congress, last Congress. Uh, we couldn't get to a point where a compromise could be made, and to be perfectly frank, it's very challenging to, um, to find the support necessary in the Senate to get 60 votes uh, on a bill to, to ban asbestos, and in the House right now, the, the outlook is even worse. So uh, there is a lot of hope uh, in the TOSCA reauthorization, that, that, um, that some progress can be made, but uh, we're gonna continue to work and through the advocacy that you all are gonna go out and do to educate some offices on how important this is, hopefully we can continue to, to work on this. I'm sorry? Are there any restrictions now at all on the use of asbestos? I, I mean, just OSHA. Um, right. There just would be OSHA workplace guidelines, um, but there's no ban, so asbestos can be used. Uh, pretty much the automotive industry is a, is a very big uh, a proponent for keeping uh, asbestos in use. Uh, and then there's an argument about the number of fibers that could be allowed or should be allowed. Uh, and, you know, we, we, we all represent a group that we really believe that there should be, a, you know, complete ban, zero fibers, because it's never been quantified how much asbestos it takes to cause mesothelioma. Uh, and we know that some uh, individuals are probably more susceptible than others, so where it could take a cupful for one person, it could take one fiber for another. So there's no safe level of asbestos anywhere in this world. I'm sorry, I think Sue, um, Sue, please. Do you want to come? Do you want to come I, talk I in the mic? They wanted to talk to me about it, and they kind of picked the wrong person because despite having an Italian surname, I'm full-blooded Irish and very stubborn. <laughs> but I, I talked to them, and they said, well, we make duct tape and duct tape has asbestos in it. How will that ever hurt anybody? And I said, well, I don't know, you tell me, what happens when duct tape gets really, really old and it starts to crumble? Or what happens if duct tape is wrapped around a pipe or some part of a building and the building burns? What happens to that fiber? And there was no response on the other end. They hadn't thought about it in the long term. So part of what we've got here is a lot of interests that are thinking about it in the immediate profit short term and not in the liability long term. And so in addition to being concerned about the ban, I'm going, I'm going to say way too much and I apologize. But in addition to being worried about the ban, we need to be worried about the state by state effort that is being made to limit liability on companies that's going on around this country. We had a bill in Minnesota this spring. They'd been waiting for several years to try to get this bill through that would have eased the liability on successor companies that buy other companies with asbestos liability. This is being pushed at a national level, statewide, or in every state in this country. I believe they've passed it in 13 states already. It may be more than that. I know for a fact that the good state, state Supreme Court in Texas overturned the law because they felt it violated the Constitution and the right that we as citizens have to seek redress in the court system. Um, but it's, it's passing in other states, and in other states there are not Supreme Courts that are turning it over. So in addition to be, being concerned about the ban, we also have to be concerned about efforts to take away the, the responsibilities that these companies, these employers, these industries have for the diseases that we're being exposed to. Sorry. I said way Okay, we, we have to wrap it up. I'm really, really sorry. There will be other opportunities um, in the course of the, the days that we have here. Um, many of us have appointments now with our elected representatives. 
We have a few minutes to get there. Um, I, want to, um, I want to thank you all for joining us. This was a very important briefing. Um, mesothelioma is devastating, we know that. But it's people such as those of us who are here who go and knock on doors and speak the truth, tell it like it is, and let your representatives know the, the absolutely urgent need for funding to put an end to this disease. Have a 